Hello and welcome to Digital Construction Conversations, brought to you by MBS. I'm your host, Paul Swaddle, and every episode I'll be talking to interesting people connected to the digital construction industry. Ahead of Earth Day 2021 and the climate action taking place across April, I'm thrilled today to be joined by Professor Fionn Stevenson, Chair of Sustainable Design at Sheffield School of Architecture. Fionn is an architect, researcher, and editor at international journal Buildings and Cities, campaigns director for the Building Performance Network, and the author of Housing Fit for Purpose. The book provides an overview and helpful primer for how to implement building performance evaluation, the process of learning how buildings are actually performing against what was designed and what should be achievable with a focus on housing. One of the things I like most about Fionn's approach is that it's a very human-focused activity, much of the information coming from residents and inhabitants. Fionn is someone whose opinion I really trust, one of the most authentic people I can think of, and who as a former tutor of mine taught me a holistic sustainability and inspired me to think about the humanity of architecture and the urgency of climate policy and regulation. I hope through these conversations, we can start to see digital construction as part of much larger social, economic and community influences and impact on a global scale. So that issues like sustainability can no longer be an afterthought or an add-on, but urgently become the core foundation designing the built environment. So here's my conversation with Professor Fionn Stevenson. Fionn, a question I ask everyone is how they explain what they do to someone from outside the built environment industries, um, especially with lots of terminology and acronyms across construction. And I wondered if that's slightly easier uh, for you in academia, where you may have to summarize uh, what you do. But even that high level introduction demonstrates that you've got so many facets to what you do. Um, How do you describe the work that you carry out? I guess, um, I mean, as an architect, I've very much become a, what I'd call a, a housing doctor. So my my aim is to um, help people to be able to live um, well and to live healthily in their homes and to help um, d- the design team to be able to design homes that are really healthy and, and good to live in. And then mm. as a secondary aspect, I'd say that that sits side by side with helping us to live sustainably on the planet. So those two go together, really. Yeah. And your book, Housing Fit for Purpose, focuses on BPE, building performance evaluation, um, which is a real combination of social and building sciences. For someone who isn't from the industry, how do you define BPE? So BPE, which stands for building performance evaluation, um, is basically a cyclical process where at every stage of the program for commissioning a new building, Um, seeing whether it's feasible, designing it, constructing it, using it, living in it, and even, you know, down to taking it apart. Um, What what the evaluation Mm. process does is to check continuously that the design intentions are actually being met by what's being done. So it's very much a kind of um, continual evaluation to make sure that the whole building process stays on track and does what it's supposed to do. And do you think that the it surprises you that post post occupancy evaluation and building performance evaluation isn't better understood or better adopted across the industry i think the answer to that question would be both yes and no um yes i i understand why post occupancy evaluation which is a, a bit of a misnomer it's it's probably better to call it occupancy evaluation but i understand yeah. why An evaluation of a building once it's occupied is not being done. And that's because quite simply, it's not regulated for, Mm. but it's not required um, by the government. And, you know, we know in the building industry and in the housing industry, we know from research that um, housing developers, contractors, the design team, everyone responds to regulation as a baseline and if the regulation's there, it will happen. But if the regulation is not there, there's absolutely no guarantee it'll happen. So, yes, I understand why it's not being done. But no, I really don't understand why it's not being done. <laughs> because um, it just seems nuts to me. I mean, there's a fantastic um, cartoonist called Lewis Hellman, 
who used mm. to regularly publish cartoons in the Architects Journal. And one of my favorite cartoons is of, you know, four people sitting on a flying carpet with blindfold folds around their heads. And I use it in my book. And these four people are literally flying blind. And they are the client, the financier, mm. um, the design team and the builder. And, you know, really what Hellman is saying in that very telling cartoon is that we are literally as a sector, as an industry, we are flying blind when we make buildings because we we never learn from our mistakes because we never look, we never get feedback from what we've done. So we go yeah. from one project to the next without fully understanding what we're doing. Um, so it does really, really surprise me that um, yeah. we don't automatically do it. Yeah. And is the situation better or worse in housing? Are commercial clients more yeah. likely to be assessing the performance of their building? I think it's harder. I think it's a lot mm. harder. I mean, my expertise, I am a housing architect and, and I've always loved housing. And I started off life as a, um, a housing worker uh, running a short life housing association in, in London for the homeless. So oh, I'm really, really passionate about housing for people, good housing. Yeah. And um, I, I guess what I discovered, though, when I got into housing is that it's an incredibly personal thing. And, it, it, you know, you're dealing with people's lives directly. They, they sleep in their homes. They, they live in their homes. They're, they're very, very private places. So actually, it's no surprise that um, building performance evaluation and post-occupancy evaluation first took off in the commercial sector, but first took off in, in offices. Um, because these are places where traditionally people went to work from nine till five. They were shared spaces. Um, they weren't seen as particularly private spaces necessarily. And uh, so it was far, far easier to ask people what they thought about working in their office. After all, it wasn't their own office necessarily. It was someone else's office. So it was a lot <laughs> e easier to ask them. Whereas, you know, when it comes to people's homes... Um, I mean, first of all, your home is often your pride and joy. Uh, it's often mm. something you've invested a lot in. Um, so people are understandably quite cautious about um, a stranger coming into their home and asking them, well, you know, do you mind if I have a look around your home to see if it works? And one of the analogies I really like in the book is an MOT for housing. And, you know, to ensure that cars are safe and within environmental targets, cars get tested annually. So should volume house builders and, and housing providers be required to provide that regular evaluation of homes? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting that you, you raise that idea of, of the MOT. Um, it's actually something that myself and uh, Professor Sandy Halliday first raised with the Scottish government in a think piece we did for them. And I think it was in 2003. So that's heading for 20 mm. years ago. And we suggested this idea of a, an MOT for buildings um, as a, a kind of regular inspection. I think at that point, it was quite a novel idea. I, th I think since then, we have seen various initiatives to try and drive in that direction. Mm. So, for example, I mean, commercial buildings are required to provide logbooks. Regulations have changed insofar as, um, you know, there are regular inspections now required for uh, certain services, you know, the inspection of your boiler. Um, so certain aspects are beginning to be written into regulation uh, in terms of needing regular evaluation. But I think the big trick that the government has missed is seeing the building as a kit of parts mm. um, rather than seeing it as, as, as a whole entity. And, um, you know, it, it doesn't regulate for... Uh, regular uh, evaluations of, of the whole building and how it's performing. Housing associations do annual tenant surveys and uh, yeah. ten tenant satisfaction surveys. But, I mean, frankly, they're not fit for purpose. You know, they, they tell the housing associations what's happening. Uh, in other words, their tenants will say, we're not satisfied or we are satisfied. But they very rarely get why this yeah. is happening. Um, yeah. and, and that's really what we need from building performance evaluation is understanding why things are working or why they're not working. And so in terms of if you were to 
try to implement an MOT for housing, what are the barriers to making that a reality? Is it purely legislative and policy-based? Um, there are a number of barriers. I, I think they're all possible to overcome, um, but there are a number of barriers. I mean, the very first one I mentioned was the privacy factor, mm. which is, um, I mean, we were until we we um, came out of the EU, you know, we were very much subject to EU data privacy laws, and we're still subject to UK privacy laws. Mm. And, you know, they're good. They say, basically, you you should only collect data on people, personal data, if there is a public interest. Um, yeah. So, you know, with housing, that is a genuine barrier. You know, we have to demonstrate continuously that any data we collect is only really for the public interest. Um, but that's a barrier that can be overcome. Um, you know, providing it's explained to people what, what the evaluation's for um, in an information sheet and they're given a chance to give their consent or withhold their consent, then in, in my time of doing this kind of work over, I don't know what, 25 years now, um, mm. I've never actually had a resident refuse, oddly enough. That's really interesting. Um, you know, they're... On, on the contrary, most residents are really keen to engage with evaluation processes. They want to know what's going on. And also they want a chance to tell their story. Yes. So, um, so that barrier, I think, can be overcome. But, I mean, there are some other barriers. So I think cost mm -hmm. is a potential barrier. Although, um, you know, the uplift on a, a, a larger housing scheme, if you do do a thorough building performance evaluation, could be as little as... 0.2%. I mean, mm. it's really not necessarily a huge cost uplift. And one of the barriers is the myths that surround yeah. building performance evaluation. And one of the myths, myths is cost. So mm. I recommend a, a graduated approach where you do what you need to do, um, not what's nice to do. So you only yeah. do as much evaluation as you need to do. And that can really keep the cost down. But, you know, cost is one. Um, other areas that typically come up are um, the issue of liability um, mm. in relation to prof professional indemnity insurance um, and the, the, the notional risk to a reputation if things are discovered. But again, I think, you know, these have largely grown up around myths. Um, and the myth is that it's actually when post-occupancy evaluation hasn't been done and when things have been discovered accidentally, errors in construction have been discovered, you know, um, without a proper POE process, then things go really badly wrong. Um, mm. but, and so then people think, oh, well, well, if you're going to do post-occupancy, um, that's just going to be a real problem because it's going to uncover problems and, you know, everybody's going to blame everybody else. No, that's mm. wrong. The exact opposite happens. Yeah. So what actually happens is if you plan for POE and bring everybody on board at the beginning and you design in all your processes as part, part of the uh, project development, so you build in the costs at the feasibility stage, you make sure you've got the right metering designed in, um, you make so sure you've got the right protocols designed for, then actually you can introduce a very smooth POE process, a very smooth evaluation process. And the beauty of it is you actually de-risk your project because you start, you start learning and identifying any potential issues early on and catching yeah. them and dealing with them as you go along. But that's another, you know, that's another potential barrier is people worrying about the risk to their reputation. And sure. it's, it's one that I think is um, often a case of trying to demonstrate to the design team that they actually have nothing to fear from um, errors being uncovered in the POE, providing everyone's brought along on the basis, on a contractual basis of if problems occur, we're not going to blame each other, we're going to solve the problems. Yeah. And that can involve using a different type of contract, for example, using a partnership sure. contract instead of a design and build or a traditional JTC. So I think those are the main barriers. I think for housing privacy, perceived mm. cost as opposed to actual cost, um, and perceived liability issues as opposed to actual liability issues. And in, in theory, that feedback loop should be happening. There's a section in 
the book on the RIBA plan of work and there's certainly that recommendation that stage seven late latter stage information is feeding back into the next brief to improve you know the the housing or the um next iteration of what's being done can you foresee that improving over time say for example with factory building and modern methods of construction to try to iterate housing in a different way that's a really good question um I think it's really important to disaggregate product approaches from process approaches. Mm. So I think, I mean, there's a lot of hope resting on the MMC, the Modern Methods of Construction yeah. sector. And I have to say, I think some of that hope can be badly misplaced <laughs> unless people actually build in a different perspective to MMC, which is to see it as um, bespoke MMC. Mm. So my experience in the past when I was an architect um, and also as a researcher was watching Housing Association engage, um, this was a consortium of housing associations in Scotland, engaging with MMC, um, both concrete and timber products, um, as, a, as a system, as an innovative system to try and improve their quality assurance, try and improve their production process. And actually, it all went disastrously wrong. Okay. And it went wrong for two reasons. So the first reason is that it's very important to understand that whilst MMC in and of itself is, can be a standardized process, the site never is standardized. The site is always unique, both in terms of topography, climate, flora, fauna, culture, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So the challenge that MMC has is how to introduce a standard product to a specific location. And this is where the myth about buildings being like a car factory, like MMC being like a car factory, that myth needs to be bust. Buildings are not cars. Mm. You know, you can spend thousands of hours developing a car prototype and you produce the car and it's designed to drive all over the country. It can drive anywhere. Um, it has a set specification and that car will be yeah. the same wherever it is. That's not architecture. Architecture should not be the same wherever it is. Because it's really interesting it, it stays because in, it's contextual. And, absolutely. It, it should yeah. be des designed for place. Mm. Um, so what the MMC industry has got to get to grips with is how to do mass bespoke architecture. Um, and that means doing custom build. And that means doing customized MMC and really accepting the fact that we probably need a bioregional approach to MMC, you know, which actually looks at the place in terms of the, the regional properties of that place. Potential for modern methods of construction, I mean, there is a potential for standardizing um, a number of the processes. And I think if um, I'm actually working right now with a, a PhD student with Urban Splash, um, looking oh, at brilliant. modern methods of construction and, and POE, and we're actually mm. evaluating um, four of their projects that have used modern methods of construction. So that's very interesting. And I guess, you know, one of the challenges is that that point you made about the, the feedback point, you know, when do you feed back into the beginning of the process? And there are a number of contingencies you need to overcome to ensure that happens. And interestingly, one of them is quite simply staff continuity. Mm. That if, if, the, if the system, if the BIM system isn't fully automated to ensure that, you know, the knowledge is captured from the project as an object, put into the BIM, you know, put into the facility Absolutely. management process yeah. and then fed back into the design team. If any personnel change along the way, then um, the interpretation of that information that's been fed in can only be as good as the manner in which it's been fed in. And so if it's fed in by one person on a presumption that the next person will understand it. That's and, very interesting. You know, yeah. they haven't kind of fully explained then quite often the POE feedback might not be understood by the new team. I've, I've heard you speak before about how we often see sustainable homes as one-off builds or 
specialist uh, innovation park exemplars, those kind of things. But that thousands of homes are being built that all look very similar every day. So what would be the one change you'd like to see in the average house being built in the UK? Is it materials? Is it building type? Is it something to do with its The one change, behavior? that's such a good question. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, I guess in terms of the climate emergency, the one change I'd like to see with all existing housing is to get that upgrade, just to, mm. to get that upgrade, to get that insulation to get that passive design wrap. Um, I mean, we have so much housing that is below EPCC, mm. uh, the Energy Performance Certificate Level C. And, you know, we know if we're going to beat the climate emergency, we need to get that up to at least A and um, Level A. And so, you know, I, I can look out of my window just now as we're talking and I'm looking at a bunch of bungalows at the bottom of my garden and they've all got double glazing so that's great <laughs> but i'm looking at the walls and i know that they are cavity insulation walls that probably haven't even got the the 50 to 100 mil cavity full of insulation yeah. and they certainly haven't got any insula external insulation and actually looking at them all they could all accommodate that so i would love to see a, a proper green deal government program that, mm. that captures the low-hanging fruit, because I think we have to be clever about this. You know, we, sure. we, we can't just say, right, let's go and insulate every building, um, because there are some buildings that are very, very difficult to insulate. Yeah. But actually just to insulate the ones that are easy to insulate and to go for the ones that are losing the most heat. Um, you know, so to, to, do, to do that insulation program in an intelligent way, not a market-led way, needs oh, sure. to be government led and it needs to be strategic and you know it needs to be based on the house condition survey and actually really targeting um the the areas that will have the most effect on fuel poverty and the most effect on reducing heat loss yeah i admit i struggle to keep track of all of the various retrofit grants and green better homes programs and other things that happen or are underway if someone is thinking of retrofitting their home is that the key advice is to boost the amount of insulation yeah i mean the, the the way we start is we always suggest to any any person wanting to try and improve the performance of their home that they try and reduce their energy demand first you mm. always reduce your energy demand first so that basically means reducing the heat loss from your mm. home in the winter in the uk um, and also reducing the overheating. Increasingly, it's about reducing the overheating. And what's wonderful is insulation properly applied with the correct ventilation strategy can actually do both. You know, it can keep yes. the heat out and it can keep the heat in. So it's a win-win. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there, there, the government doesn't help us. Um, you know, if you go to the Energy Savings Trust website, um, there are all sorts of grants, as you say. There are renewable energy grants, and um, although in general that now the government is saying you can't get your renewable energy until you've done your your insulation first, um, I, I think there is a, a myth out there, and there are still plenty of people who would like to put photovoltaics or solar panels mm. um, or geothermal heat pumps or whatever. You know, they want to go for the eco bling. Mm. without just doing the really boring, unsexy thing of adding some insulation around the building first. I'm always interested in your uh, perspective. I've heard you speak about the difference between energy efficiency and sufficiency. Could you explain that in a bit more detail? Yeah, I mean, I'd introduce a third term as well. I was just talking this morning to someone about this. Um, so I think we're talking about energy efficiency energy effectiveness mm. and sufficiency. So to just explain the difference between those three terms and why just talking about energy efficiency is so limiting, energy efficiency is basically a throughput measure. So when we talk about energy efficiency, we talk about the amount of energy that we're using um, over a given period of time. Um, 
And and so the, the typical energy efficiency measure is kilowatt hours uh, per meter per year. Uh, mm. And that's the one that's been rolled out across Europe and that the UK government uses. And that's become the kind of lingua franca for, for the discussion about how to make our homes sustainable. But all that is describing is how much energy you're using, not the full amount of energy you're using. It's about how much energy you're using over time. Mm. And so if you say a house is 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year, energy efficiency, that doesn't tell you the total amount of energy that that house is using in a given year. Sure. Um, it also doesn't tell you um, how big that house is and, and you know, whether it's excessive energy or not. Um, and it also doesn't tell you necessarily how effective um, the efficiency is. So, okay, mm. you're getting this kind of low throughput, but how effective is that? I mean, it could be that the person in the house is freezing. <laughs> you know, you could have this wonderful 15 kilowatt hour thing and they could be they could have just turned off their heating. So yeah. there's a question of effectiveness, which is really about the appropriateness of the energy efficiency. So once you've got a energy efficiency, you need to look at how effective the solution is in terms of actually meeting people's needs. Yeah. And then the next stage after that, it, the other aspect of effectiveness is how it meets the needs of the planet. Mm. And, um, you know, in the climate emergency, I mean, I think we're getting very strong messages. I, I tend to think of the planet as one big organism. You know, it's one I mm. very much go along with James Lovelock's Gaia theory. And I do think sure. we have a self-regulating planet. And I think the planet is sort of sending out distress signals at the moment in terms mm. of the climate emergency. It's also sending out distress signals in terms of COVID-19. So, um, I mean, you could think about it metaphorically like that. And I suppose sufficiency is where we get into that conversation where we say we need to respect the planetary limits um, that will allow us to keep living and to survive on this planet and to thrive. And we need to understand those limits. And basically, we need to work within those limits. So the, the big question of sufficiency is, what is going to be sufficient in terms of energy use in order for us to live comfortably but within planetary means? Mm. So Elizabeth Shove is very, very good on this, Professor Elizabeth Shove from Lancaster University. She's, she's really been pioneering the thinking around sufficiency from a, a social point of view. And... Um, you know, she's quite provocative. She does things like walk into lectures wearing a very thick... Um, coat with a big hood on it. And, you know, her point is, you know, this, this is an aspect of sufficiency. I, I can keep myself sufficiently warm by putting this coat on. I don't yeah. need to heat up this huge room in order to keep my, myself warm. So thinking yeah. about sufficiency is a whole different mindset. You know, you start thinking about, well, what would be enough um, yes. for me to yeah. actually live comfortably, but not overdo it. And, yeah. what would, and, and, and what does that mean in terms of my impact on the planet? So sufficiency Absolutely. is very much about eco-footprinting and understanding the overall impact that each of us are having on the planet. And um, yeah, living within our means. And it's a kind of different um, metric from energy efficiency. And uh, it's quite a controversial one. It's... Um, it's one that people aren't always comfortable with in, yeah. in a capitalist society where the notion of sufficiency runs diametrically opposite to the notion of profit and mm. you know, excess value. I mean, sufficiency would say we should design buildings to be re reusable and be able to deconstruct them and build them again from the same pieces. But the way the economic system's set up is that's just not very profitable. It's very yeah. profitable to the planet and to, to, to us living on the planet within our means, but it doesn't generate excess value. I think it leads neatly onto last year, I think I heard you talk about indoor air quality and the buildup of carbon dioxide in homes. But clearly, the, previous, you know, the last 12 months has placed a huge scrutiny on fresh air and 
the suitability of our built environment, whether it's office space, whether it's our houses becoming our workplaces, openable windows for ventilation. How has the pandemic changed your perspective or might influence your work when it comes to things like thinking about ventilation or air change rates, that kind of thing? Interestingly enough, it, in many ways, it hasn't. It's mm. kind of, it hasn't necessarily changed the way I think, because I think for a lot of us that are very concerned about ventilation issues and particularly natural ventilation strategies versus mechanical ventilation strategies, a lot of the issues that COVID has thrown up is something that we've already been aware for for quite a long time. It's just that instead of dealing with um, um, nitrous oxide pollution from, yeah. from cars or boilers, um, which has been prevalent all the time in homes, um, or dealing with carbon dioxide buildup in homes, which again has been around all the time, yeah. I think what's happened is COVID has been really helpful to those of us who've been concerned with these issues because it's it's brought these issues much more to the forefront by mm. by exaggerating the problem. Again, if I was to think of it philosophically on a Gaia principle, you know, is is the kind of the Earth planetary systems forcing us to educate ourselves about how we really need to ventilate our buildings. Mm. Um, and so, you know, COVID has forced us to think again about how we ensure that we get good fresh air into, into our living spaces. And yeah. it's, it's brought, ventilation's often been the Cinderella in um, architecture. I mean, it's mm. certainly something that as architects, I, I lecture on it to first year students, but, you know, environmental science is often seen as a bolt on um, because of the visual, you know, hegemony of, of, of architectural design, where yeah. what you see is so much more important than what you don't see. Yeah. But, you know, imagine a world if we were able to color the flow of air. Mm. You know, and, and that's what the, actually that's what's been so lovely with COVID is um, people like Professor Kath Noakes from from Leeds. You know, she's on the SAGE committee. She's a wonderful woman, um, you know, ventilation queen. Um, she <laughs> she has um, been involved with and has publicized um, lots of studies on how to improve ventilation. And also, you know, there have been marvelous um short videos showing what it's like when someone breathes COVID, mm. you know, and, and so you suddenly you get That's these, right. yeah. these sort of wonderful visual representations. Visual representations. Yeah. And, and this is what we need in architecture. This is what we need yeah. in housing design is to have visual representations of how the air we're breathing in the home is actually moving around. Yeah. Um, I mean, some very radical architects go even further and they, they actually talk about air as a material. Yes. So they actually yeah. make the air solid and, you know, they mm. talk about the materiality of the air. And uh, that's also a very interesting way of thinking about air. But, um, you know, this idea of making airflow visible so that we can see it and we can see when it's not working and we can see when it is working, I think would be really helpful to designers because I think often designers just have not got a clue yeah. about how the air is moving around their buildings. Yeah. Maybe one way it has changed the way in which I'm thinking is um, it has re-spatialized the city, um, but in a way that I, I would promote anyway, which is um, obviously the past models of cities have, has been about densification mm. and increasing housing density and getting everybody to live hugger mugger. And there's always been a debate between the compact city and the broad acre city. So between yes. the, 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 the European style, let's, let's get tight together so we can save energy and save resources. And then Frank Lloyd Wright, let's, each, let's spread out like the American cities and all grow our own veg in our gardens. Mm. And I do think COVID throws up some very interesting challenges there because it does tend to push us towards a de-densification of, of cities. So I guess that has been one thing I've been thinking quite a lot about, which is um, how our cities are going to reshape themselves and probably de-densify in the very center so that offices are going to be far less dense. And, yeah. um, you know, we, 
I don't know that homes will necessarily be a lot dense, uh, less denser because, in fact, we can be quite secluded in our homes. But I do think the commercial sector will probably de-densify quite a lot. Yeah, I guess, you know, along with all the tragedy and lives lost, there has been a positive aspect, I suppose, of resurgence in green spaces and the need for people to be outside, people starting gardens, community allotments, you know, those yeah. kind of things that... Yeah, that lots of I'm good hoping, things. Yeah, yeah, hoping that there's a, a drive towards some more green space. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and I watched the film um, that you uh, made with uh, Brazilian colleagues about mm. dengue fever. And um, as I understand it, that citizen science could be applied to reducing um, the impact of of those types of viruses in those homes. Can you perhaps see that there are parallels to how that could be applied post COVID? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's such a nice question because in fact, um, uh, that video was meant to extend into a discussion of how to how to bring it over to the UK, but I was warned off it because um, oh, the the reviewer said, "Don't panic, <laughs> don't panic," <laughs> and and um, you know it was a bit crazy actually because then of course we got COVID, so you know the, <laughs> we were panicked anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it was really funny that they said, "Oh, you know, if you if you start talking about using this kind of citizen science for for virus detection, you know, in the U UK, you're you're going to make everybody think dengue is coming to." The UK and I was saying, well, yeah. but COVID's here already. Um, yeah. I mean, citizen science is a fantastically um, exciting area, and um, it's happening a lot already um, in all sorts of um, different dimensions. Um, I mean, there have been quite a lot of studies in London done with academics where citizens have been encouraged to take measurements of the traffic pollution, particularly. Um, yeah. So there's been a lot of mass study of traffic pollution. Um, I think, I mean, I wrote about citizen science in my my book on um, housing fit for purpose because I, I see it as an innovative form of occupancy evaluation where um, instead, of, instead of people and, and residents having um, POE experts come into their home and sort of stick sensors all over it and sort of treat them a bit like lab rats, um, I think actually this kind of occupancy evaluation can be really empowering for the people who are living in their homes because they can do it themselves. Yeah. And, um, you know, it is a bit like that song, you know, sisters are doing it for themselves where, you know, we now have, for example, um, for citizen science, you know, we are getting thermal imaging cameras that are getting cheaper and cheaper. So, you know, for a couple of hundred quid, you can plug a thermal imaging camera onto your phone and, you know, you can use that as X-ray specs. I mean, what a thermal imaging camera does is it, it shows you exactly where the insulation is in your home or where it's been missed out. So yeah. you can see the invisible heat loss directly. And, you know, we, when I was living in Sheffield, um, there was a wonderful project set up by a woman called Jenny Fortune, another architect, um, in an area of Sheffield called Healy in, in the Green Triangle and um, she did. She set up a citizen science project where people were able to borrow thermal imaging cameras and, as a community, um, teach each other, learn from each other, study each other's homes, and look at Fantastic. all the uh, heat loss that was going on and do things about it. Yeah. So you know that's so empowering. That's people learning yeah. about how their homes work. So yes, I, I do think um, I think citizen science could be very very powerful. I have to say, if I get political, um, I think there are huge forces ranged with us mm. to help us empower ourselves as citizens with, with mm. technology. I think there are also huge forces ranged against us from industry who would actually like to do the opposite and control mm. our lives. And uh, this all comes down to the area of the smart home. Yeah. And there's a furious debate taking place between those who have, those of us, and I include myself, who are concerned that the smart home will actually dumb down the occupant by doing everything yeah. for the person. I think you describe it as 
they're almost disempowered by it in your book. That yeah, they, yeah. The inhabitants is, can feel disempowered by those systems. That's what I mean about the dumbing down, is that it actually, you know, the agency that people have in their homes can be taken away from them by technology yeah. as much as enabling it. So, um, I mean, to give you an example of that that's being industry-led at the moment, um, in terms of trying to reduce energy demand, we, we know that... Um, the biggest challenge we face in the UK and many other countries is not so much the perpetual energy demand, but the peaks that we get mm. on the grid and the fact that the grid then has to be designed, the grid infrastructure, the energy grid infrastructure, the electricity grid has to be designed to cope with the maximum peak. And traditionally what, what um, the government has done is asked heavy industry, if there's a problem with supplying the power, then um, the government has asked heavy industry to, to power down in extreme mm -hmm. cases. And obviously with trying to switch to renewables, um, you know, there is a fluctuation and there is a new approach needed to managing energy where we try and energy balance. Yes. And that sounds great until it comes down to the actual consumer. And so what we're getting now is a lot of projects that are looking at forcing the consumer to choose when they're going to do their washing, when they're going to have a shower. I mean, it's a bit like the bad old days when we used to have night storage heaters and, and you know, everybody mm. had to do their washing at midnight because that's when you got yeah. the cheap energy. That's now becoming much more ubiquitous. But the real concern is that the energy prices will fluctuate, not just per hour, but per minute. Yes. And you know, yeah. my concern is in all this, what, where does the hapless resident end up, you know, furiously trying to you know, energy balance their activities against what's demanded of them. Absolutely. And I think yeah. so often we're in a kind of boiled frog syndrome where we don't even realize the water is being heated up and beginning to boil in terms of things that are being done to us that we're not aware of. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think there's a really serious social debate that isn't happening enough around smart homes. If we do go back to the car analogy... Um, in the past, you know, uh, we were able to mend cars and, you know, people could even do roadside fixes. But mm. cars have become very, very black box now. And actually, you know, they've completely disempowered the driver. You know, if a car breaks down now, they, you, nobody can mend it. You have to take it to the garage. You have to get the whole unit replaced. And of course, that makes more profit for the car manufacturer. So there's a reason why things are being black boxed. And the same is now happening with homes. Mm. Um, you know, that it's much harder to repair boilers. Boilers now have huge components where the plumber has to replace the whole unit. You know, they can't just mm. replace a small bit. So, mm. and, you know, my concern is that with the smart home that we'll get the same situation where it'll be um, ubiquitous sensors, but if something goes wrong, you have to replace the whole system. It's related to that idea that, um, and it also relates to the ethical aspects that you talked the privacy. about. privacy where there's data collection now on a giant scale. And is it likely that that data could be exploited by third party companies um, as it's being collected? Or do you think that already there's sufficient anonymization or aggregation of that data that that's not the case? Yeah, um, it's a bit like the Facebook debate in terms of uh, how much... Um how much of our privacy do we give up? So certainly mm. when I've been doing studies, um, the occupancy studies, and we've got sensors in the home, um, I mean, typically in the past, we might have only had two or three sensors that would be looking at temperature, humidity. Um, but as things get more complicated, they, they will probably reach the stage of one of my um, occupancy evaluation pro projects, which was the Sigma Home back in um, 2010, when we, we actually had about 23 different occupancy evaluation methods on the go at once. I mean, it was very experimental. But, you know, yeah. we had things like we were able to monitor when windows were open and closed. Oh, wow. We were able to monitor when where which room people were in, how long they were in the room for. Um, you know, we were able to monitor a lot. Um, the the occupants, I'm very pleased to say, were a, a family who were very willing to let us do this as part of the big experiment. So they'd volunteered to do this and, that you know, they were well rewarded for it. Um, but they, um, you know, they were keen to help. 
And mm. it was a fantastic project with, with Stuart Milne, um, uh, housing developer, really great project. We got so much out of it. But there was this, you know, this privacy issue. And I, you know, for me, it was the first time that I had kind of got involved in such an intense project. And it did make me feel uncomfortable at times. And I think the way we've got around this at the moment is we talk about different levels of aggregation of data mm-hmm. or the granularity of data. And, and what I mean by that is that um, personal data is down to the individual. But if you are looking at um, 50 homes and you're doing all this censoring, um, but you do it in such a way that you can't, uh, you can't disaggregate it down to the individual so you can get yeah. results for the 50 homes and say, well, we know across these homes this is what's happening. Um, that's one way around it is to aggre- aggregate the data up um, so that actually it's impossible to tell which particular house that data has come from. And you can start to do that probably once you get up to about five homes or so, you can start to do Interesting. that. Interesting. But it does mean that if you're going, if you're getting involved with someone on an individual basis, you know, a one off house that's been developed by a small developer um, and there's a post occupancy evaluation study, then, you know, there has to be an informed consent on the understanding from those residents that any data they provide will be will be personal. Um, I mean, it can be anonymized. They can have their name taken off it, but, you know, it's, it's still personal data. And something else that, that relates to you that I know you're, that you're passionate about is the ergonomics of those controls and the ability for an inhabitant to have um, an agency over the control of their heating, their lighting, all of those things. Can you talk about how that affects your evaluation work? Yeah. Um, ergonomics is, again, a bit of a Cinderella subject. I mean, there seems to have been a new term for it now, which is called UX, user experience. Mm. Yeah. Um, and actually, I mean, there's a great book just come out now from um, Judith Kimpian, Sophie Palsmacher and Hattie Harmon um, called Energy, People and Buildings. And mm. there's a great section in that book on on UX, user experience. And um the important thing about, I'm going to talk about user experience rather than ergonomics, just because I guess it's easier to understand that way. The important thing about understanding how the user experiences their environment or how the resident experiences their home is that it's a totally haptic um, event. You know, it is something that relates to all of their senses. So the user experience includes how we smell in our homes, how we hear in our homes, how we see in our homes how we touch in our homes, um, how we perceive our homes. And and when that Mm. comes down to how we control our homes, I I have been very passionate about trying to foreground the very poor design of what I call touch points in the home. So Mm. places where people need to literally touch and interact with the home in order to get things done. Now, a lot of those touch points are now being digitized by the smart home so in fact, you no longer need to touch. You can simply speak um, yes. to get the light on, or you can speak to get um, the ventilation fan switched on. Um, but e- even with that speaking, seemingly taking away the problem of whether something's well designed for our hands or not, um, the user experience extends beyond us as individuals trying to control our homes to the workmen who come in to replace parts. Um, You know, if we take the classic example of heating equipment, um, I've just moved into a new house here in Dundee, not a new house, sorry, 1930s house in Dundee. And, you know, I want to replace the boiler in Mm. the kitchen and put something greener in. But the first thing I noticed was we couldn't even get into the boiler (laughs) <laughs> because the boiler has been placed into a cupboard. The kitchen, beautiful Neff kitchen unit has been all built in around the boiler. The around boiler's, it. boiler's hidden away behind this cupboard door. And there is literally, um, I think it's about 300 millimeters in front of the of boiler. Of access. Of yeah. access. And, you know, when yeah. we got the plumber around to just have a look at it, he said, my God, you know, this is this is crazy. Yeah. And I, unfortunately, I'd, I'd missed that, you know, um, when we when we did the house inspection. I just hadn't 
clocked that, you know, I couldn't access this thing. Um, so, you know, I think this issue of access um, and maintenance and how we design to be able to access equipment in the home. Yeah. And that particularly extends to things, very simple things that the architect fails to consider uh, in terms of universal design and universal access. Windows. Of course. How many windows do we see where you can't get up to clean them unless you get on a ladder? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I think the user experience is something we, we don't pay enough attention to as architects. I think designers do. I think we see user experience considered more um, by designers in other areas. But I think as architects, we get a little bit of it in first year, um, the first year of our studies where we're sort of taught to look at the space needed to do things. And then it's just kind of presumed that we know. Yes. Yeah. Which leads neatly on to, um, I know that uh, there's clearly obviously still a lot of education, perhaps not education, perhaps lobbying more so to do around the need for these kind of evaluations and understandings. Um, and you're involved with the Building Performance Network. And if I understand correctly, it's a group of organizations aiming to share and centralize some of the data and guidance. Yeah, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, I mean, it's a best practice organization, uh, be best practice network, which is why it's called a network. And it's a national network in the UK. And basically a number of, of, of leading companies have, have joined it, um, some leading academic institutions. And it's exactly that. Um, the Building Performance Network aims to create a forum where um, members can share what they're doing in terms of building performance evaluation, um, where the organization itself can drive forward research um, driven by industry, joined up with academia. So research projects are identified. I mean, the, the main research project that's up on the website at the moment, BPN website, um, is a state of the nation report on housing mm. performance. Um, oh, brilliant. So, you know, that's that's a research project that's, that's up there. My job really is as campaigns director, um, I've got a very specific role, which I'm passionate about, to help the BPN network to really lobby for um, improved regulation and to, 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 to lobby strategically to get building performance evaluation onto the map and, and properly regulated and, and properly included for everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the nice thing is it's part of a family of organizations. So there are other organizations like the Good Homes Network, mm. um, the um, Wood Knowledge Wales is another great organization. Um, and, you know, a number of these organizations are also looking in part at building performance evaluation. So I think one thing that the BPN Network is really great for is helping these other organizations, these other NGOs, to serve them, to give them the kind of the yes. very best practice information we have, you know, we can act as a portal for them. Yeah. So they think, ah, oh, well, I'm trying to design good housing and I've now got to the bit where I need to do the building performance evaluation. Where is the go-to place? Ah, BPN, Building Performance Network. That's what they specialize Thanks. in. So I think, I, you know, we're a specialist organization um, within the, the building sector where we're we're very much purely focused on building performance evaluation. That's our calling card. That's excellent. I spoke recently and did a webinar with um, Talene Josephson at Chetwoods Architects. And she's involved with groups like the Architects Climate Action Network. There's now, what, a thousand practices signed up to Architects Declare. There's the ICE Shaping Zero campaign. Are you as a professor noticing an increase in climate literacy or activism among your students. I think Talene was cautiously optimistic that her generation of designers do have the climate emergency at the forefront of their thinking. What's your perspective on that? Right. Um, so I'm a member of the Architects Climate Action Network Education Group, and I've been okay. quite active in that. Um, I was very drawn to... ACAN, as they're called, um, because it, it's quite a radical organization. 
And it's got some fantastic um, campaigning strategies and a really great bunch of people. We've got about 200 members already in the in the ACAN Education Group. And I've just published a, a special issue journal looking at mainstreaming um zero carbon in in uh, built environment education and training i think they're more aware of the need to be more literate interesting yeah but that's very different from having the literacy skills and i think the tragedy we've got at the moment and i really feel for the current generation of of students i really feel for them deeply because they're at that terrible moment where they're deeply aware of what they need to know and they know they don't know it fascinating yes so what we're trying to do in ACAN, together with the RIBA and the Construction Industry Council, um, we've just launched actually this week um, a national skills mapping project, um, which is basically a survey uh, going out to all 62 schools of architecture to ask them to complete an honest survey to say what, what skills their staff have to teach their students, because yeah. one of the reasons this generation of students has been sold short is that, if we're honest, quite a lot of the staff don't have the skills to teach those students what they need to know. So there's a massive upskilling exercise needed. And what we're excited about with this survey that's going to be completed um, by next month and results for that coming out in July is we're working with the heads of schools of architecture and the RIBA, ACAN and CIC. What we want to develop is a map, a skills map, where eventually we get to a stage where schools will be able to see which schools have got what skills and mm. we can start doing some skills sharing. And that's, again, another silver lining from COVID-19 where it's really opened up our minds to how we can use digital media to do much, much broader educational initiatives. So suddenly, because we're able to have digital meetings and compile things digitally, it can actually be relatively easy for a Birmingham School of Architecture to share its ex expertise in, in urban design, um, you know, with Sheffield School of Architecture having its skills in, in thermal comfort. Yeah, you found that it's improved that collaboration. It can do. Mm. It's not happening yet, but that's the potential <laughs> is that, you know, we could see if schools are willing to be less competitive and more collaborative, which I think must be something that comes out of COVID-19, the need to collaborate. Yeah. Then I yeah. think, you know, we could get to a situation where one school says, well, I, you know, I'll swap you. If you can give me my thermal lecture, I'll give you this in exchange and we'll do it digitally. That's fantastic. That's what we can do. We can do it online. And, um, you know, I feel very privileged to be part of that initiative, to be part of driving forward this new way of thinking about how, how to learn together. Um, so I think to go back to the very the origin of your question, I think students are very aware of what's needed. Yes. And the, the other wonderful thing to see is there's a new organization called STUCAN, uh, S-T-U-C-A-N, which has come out of ACAN, and this is a student climate action network. And students are amazing. They yeah. have re-politicized. You know, they were very political mm. in the 1980s, and then I would say probably not so political after that. There was maybe a bit of political activity when fees came in. And they're doing their own organizing. They're doing their own workshops. And they're very much driving the agenda. So, you know, for us as teachers... It's yeah. hugely exciting to see, you know, the students taking this power and empowering themselves and working with staff together. Um, exactly so, that. You know, rather than being the subjects of education, they are actually becoming the producers of their own yes. education, which is amazing. Yes. I think the tragedy of the professions at the moment is that they are aware that they need to collaborate. Absolutely. But they're still not collaborating enough. Yes. Um, yeah. And, you know, if it, for me, it all comes back to education. And the silos begin at primary school. You know, yes. primary kids are already exposed, exposed to the notion of the architect and the engineer. Yeah. And those silos solidify in year one at the university when we go into our 
different disciplinary courses. And I think one of the great things we've done at Sheffield and a number of other schools of architecture have done as well is we've developed a whole suite of programs that can produce what I call T-shaped professionals. And these are nice. professionals that have expertise in one area, but are also experts in another. So we have joint architecture and engineering programs. We have joint architecture and landscape programs, joint architecture and planning programs. And um, you know, another university like uh, the University of, of, of West England, they also have these, these sort of joint programs. And I think that that will drive the professions together is uh, the more we can produce these interdisciplinary educational programs, the more the T-shaped prof professionals who come out of them will demand that these institutions collaborate more. One of the questions I wasn't quite sure how to ask is about your own personal approach. I think the way that I think of you as a, a quite a radical person with highly informed views, but your delivery and your method of teaching has always been calm and communicative. And I wondered what your balance is between metering, I guess, the need for activism and the need to protest with the kind of diplomatic means of achieving the same goals, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's a profound question, actually. Um, I mean, it, I guess all, all of my life has been um, one of activism. Um, and in a way, I've kind of had a little bit of a double life where I've had this kind of calm teaching <laughs> approach, whilst I, at the same time being highly active um, not not just in the built environment, but very much as a feminist, um, and and also as a peace activist, um, sure. as an environmental activist. I mean, I guess the kind of it all came to a bit of a head when I was head of school at Sheffield School of Architecture, and whilst I was head, I was at the same time trying to save trees in Sheffield, street trees from being destroyed, and that's right. And I was so, as an activist, I was so incensed by all this. I kept telling myself, I'm not going to take part in this protest. I am a head of school of architecture. You know, my, <laughs> my first duty is to my students. I can't afford to get arrested. Yeah. But actually, one day I was in my study and I just heard this chainsaw. And my emotions just took over. Yeah. And I ran out yeah. of the door with my mobile, mobile phone, thank God. And I ran under the tree where the arboriculturists were trying to saw it down. And I just stood there on my own um, with my phone. And I just said to everybody, they're trying to chop this tree down and I'm here on my own and there's lots of big guys around me. <laughs> and, um, you know, they had to stop. That's the way that nonviolent direct action works is if you put your body on the line, then yeah. people have to stop what they're doing because there's a health and safety issue. But the outcome from that, the outcome from that was that I was banned by Sheffield City Council from undertaking any further form of protest within the city boundaries in relation to the wow. trees. In the end, the whole thing was turned over, the tree campaign won. But that for me was a kind of a very profound moment where, you know, I, I had to put myself on the line and say, what am I doing here? Am I, am I an activist or a head of school and how do I combine these? Yeah. Um, and that was a few years ago now. And, and since then, I guess... I've become more and more activist. Um, yes. And, you know, I am trying to bring my personal activism much more into the classroom. I mean, I always have done in a quiet way, but I think the ACAN work, you know, the working with yeah. the Architects Climate Action Network has actually allowed me to finally align my external environmental activism with my architectural teaching in a, very, in a, in a much more coherent way. Um, and I think it's very, very difficult for people to empower themselves in a system that's disempowering. Mm. So, I mean, I guess the other bit of the jigsaw comes back to Nomi Klein and her book, This Changes Everything, mm. um, which is about capitalism versus climate change. And, um, you know, the, on the one hand, we need governments to take action but on the other hand, we need people to take action. And she very much puts that forward as a thesis in her book, which is that we do need mass action. And, you know, I think 
we can see that people can do mass action. I mean, we've seen mass action brought down the Berlin Wall. Mm. Um, mass action ended the Cold War mm. by people, by people walking down streets. Um, so when society decides it's had enough of something, it can change it. We, yeah. we can be the change we want to see. But we have to really believe, firstly, that we are in an absolute emergency, climate emergency. And secondly, that we have the capability together to challenge our government and to demand something better. So, yeah. Yeah, which nicely ties uh, into my final question, which is always the same, which is, what are your hopes for the future? So they could be educational, they could be societal, your own personal development, next steps. What are your hopes for the future? Um, two hopes. So one hope is that, the, that we have a new generation of, of architects and designers who are able to heal the planet. Mm. So that's a big hope, obviously, as an educator. And then my second hope is that people of my generation, people who are in their 60s, um, that the older generation also open their eyes to what needs to be done and support the younger generations to, to make these changes. So, so I think you know, it's a double hope that, um, that younger generations are able to, to make the changes we need, but also that the older generations don't stand in their way. Yes, yeah. That's fantastic. Thanks, Fionn. Great. No, thank you, Paul. That's, that's, that's been good. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation with Professor Fionn about building performance evaluation, ethics and activism, and I hope you did too. Please subscribe to the podcast on your chosen listening platform and press like or leave a review if you can, helping more people to discover these episodes. If you have any feedback or suggestions, or you think that you have a unique perspective on digital construction and that we could have an interesting conversation, please contact us at podcast at the Until our next episode, thanks and goodbye.